We're back on InfoWars Nightly News, and I'm pleased to be joined by one of our regular contributors to the show, known to many on the internet for her popular video blogs, which of course have been instrumental in forcing the mainstream media to abandon its narrative on what's unfolding in Syria. And she, of course, goes by the name Syrian Girl. Syrian Girl, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me again. So before we get into the latest developments in Syria and explore some of the wider issues, let me set the stage with this, which I think is a key question. And that is, why should Americans care about what's taking place in Syria right now? Well, for one thing, you know, while the U.S. is facing, while the people are facing austerity measures and having to tighten their belts, so to speak, the U.S. government is giving millions and millions to fund terror abroad in Libya in, and now Syria, and before that, of course, Afghanistan 30 years ago. So uh, that's, that's one very obvious reason why it's in the U.S. people's interests to stop this money flow to um, what constitutes people with an Al-Qaeda ideology. And, you know, that terrorism that's being funded might later come back and uh, be used in a attack against the U.S. people, as well as result in the taking of more liberties by the U.S. government of the U.S. people. So the, these are the interests to the U.S. people. But also, you know, I think everybody wants a, a country, a nation, for which there is a history to be proud of. And I think the U.S. people would be the same in that because they are proud people and they want to hold their heads up high and know that uh, their country represents righteousness and not um, imperialism, neocolonialism and fueling of terror. Well, that's really the point, isn't it? Because we featured the videos on Infowars of you know, the rebels burning American flags um, vowing to fly the Al-Qaeda flag over the White House in one video. There's others where they glorify the 9-11 attacks and start chanting their support for Osama bin Laden. All the while, the Obama administration sends them half a billion dollars while telling Americans at home that their children need to be groped in the airports to fight the war on terror, while the CIA sends weapons to Al-Qaeda terrorists, known Al-Qaeda terrorists in Syria, all paid for with Americans' tax dollars while the government's telling them the country's broke. But back when you first appeared on the Alex Jones show, this notion that al-Qaeda terrorists were involved in Syria was first treated as a conspiracy theory. It then later had to be accepted as fact, but they spun it to portray the terrorist influence as minor. Now it's widely reported that the leading frontline combat fighters in Syria are these al-Qaeda terrorists supported by the Obama-backed FSA, Syrian rebels? So now the media is coming up with this new myth, which is that these Jabba al-Nusra al-Qaeda terrorists are a separate entity to the FSA rebels. So tell us about how they're crafting that phony narrative and what the real truth behind the situation is. Well, I think in the first place, the U.S. acknowledging that Jabba al-Nusra has the al-Qaeda ideology was just an easy way to use them as a scapegoat. So now when there's any uh, bombing, suicide bombing, uh, beheadings, etc., they can just say, oh, it was Jabhat al-Nusra, but the rebels are a completely separate group and they're, you know, totally angelic, clean. Um, but the fact is that, you know, both, uh, all, there's more than one Islamist group for, uh, for one thing, and I'm talking Al-Qaeda ideology group. There is a group called... Um, uh, Jabhat al-Sham, and even the FSA leaders themselves, like the former head of the opposition, Moaz al-Khataib, um, the FSA leader Idris, and one of the commanders, al-Assad, along with 89 battalions, all made statements saying that they back Jabhat al-Nusra and they stand by it, and that was at the time that the U.S. declared it a terrorist organization. Now, since then, there has been a power struggle among struggle groups in Syria um, between the FSA and the Islamist groups. However, it's not as the media is trying to portray it. It's not secularists versus Islamists. It's Islamists versus Muslim Brotherhood. So it's just like a milder form of the same thing. Um, but it's, there's no such thing as a secular uh, rebellion or rebel group 
if there is, it would be a tiny minority amongst the opposition and the um, armed insurgents. And this media is, uh, the mainstream media is just trying to uh, take this tiny group and make it out to be that, oh, you know, the, the insurgency is, is actually secular when it isn't. And of course, when we say Al-Qaeda, that's merely a label that's adopted by these jihadist groups. It's not an actual hierarchical group within itself. It's, it's an ideology that's taken on, that's adopted by these different extremist groups. Briefly explain that concept to people. Well, as you know, the original Al-Qaeda was something that the CIA built in Afghanistan, and that even had um, loose structure. And uh, as you know, there was one guy who blew the lid on it, uh, I believe his name was Cook, and he said that Al-Qaeda is basically just a database of uh, jihadists around the globe. And that's exactly what Al-Qaeda has really flourished and become, just a meme, an ideology that people have, um, that they want to um, uh, control the region under a, um, their brand of Sharia law. And even in uh, Sydney, in Australia, and all the way in the UK and other parts of Europe, there are people saying, you know, Osama bin Laden is my leader, I'm Al-Qaeda, holding up uh, placards uh, in protest saying that they support Al-Qaeda. So it, it's actually an ideology that's been uh, fueled uh, by media such as Al Jazeera, who often used to um, show Al-Qaeda uh, recordings from uh, Osama bin Laden and uh, Zawahiri as well. Um, this is, this is uh, what's happening around the Middle East now. And of course, the former British minister, Robin Cook, echoed that when he said that Al-Qaeda was just the base. It was just an entry in a computer database. So that echoes what you said. We've reported on the, the beheadings, the desecrations of churches, the attacks on schools and universities by these glorious freedom-fighting rebels. And there's a report out of the Atlantic Wire today which completely whitewashes the rape crisis that's unfolding in Syria right now claiming that only 1% of the rapes taking place are carried out by FSA rebels and basically blaming all the others on, quote, regime soldiers. And what they completely fail to mention, as I put together in an article today, is that numerous Islamic clerics have come out and issued fatwas permitting the rape of Syrian women by FSA fighters as if they had the right to do that. And there's virtually no reference to this, no stories about it in the mainstream media. So, Syrian girl, tell us about this bizarre, abhorrent sexual jihad idea that's now being circulated amongst these rebels. Well, this is just going a step back to the Al-Qaeda ideology. Now, um, the Al-Qaeda ideology is based also on a cult within Islam, which goes by the name of Salafism or Wahhabism. And it is these Salafi sheikhs that are basically sanctifying rape. Um, you know, the, uh, the refugee camps on the Jordan border are now facing uh, lots of people from Saudi Arabia, the home of Salafism and Wahhabism, coming to the refugee camps, either raping girls or purchasing them and marrying them temporarily, which are like sham marriages that um, uh, sanctify prostitution. And, uh, you know, under normal circumstances, these people would never have had a chance with these young girls. And a lot of them are, in fact, older men. So um, onward, onward with that, in a totally different place, in Tunisia, there was a sheikh called Muhammad al-Arafi, uh, who said that uh, he called on the women of Tunisia to go to Syria to participate in a sexual jihad where they would be, uh, be helping the jihad if they were to sleep around with the insurgents. So as a result, you know, um, a 16-year-old girl was kidnapped and her parents were on Tunisian TV holding up her photo and begging uh, for her kidnappers to return her. So, um, and then as another sheikh, this is the most recent uh, event, uh, called Yasir al-Ajwulani said that uh, the Christians of Syria are basically war loot and that the um, rebels can go on and just rape them because, uh, you know, they're, 
they're part of the, uh, the commodity that they can gain from the war. And I just want to say on this point, um, this cult within Islam is not Sunni Islam. I hear a lot of people blaming uh, Sunnism for this, but uh, Sheikh Bouti, who is the head Sunni uh, in Syria, called out against these rebels and actually called for jihad against the jihadists. And as a result, a few weeks later, he died in a bombing of his mosque along with 42 of his worshippers. And the Syrian military is majority Sunni as well. So uh, I just want to put that out there because, um, you know, people are getting a lot of unfair hate and I too am a Sunni. So, um, yeah, it's, it's really alien to us in Syria to have such a sick, demented, warped representation of religion. And some of these girls, they're not women. They're as young as 14 years old. I mean, who are these moron sheikhs to proclaim that rape is acceptable anywhere? I mean, what would they say if somebody proclaimed it acceptable to rape their families? How would they feel? I mean, why does anyone even pay attention to them? Because it suits them. I mean, I'm sure that uh, if he tomorrow sanctified alcohol, then they'd all be drinking it up. <laughs> so I think at the end of the day, um, so long as it suits people, they'll believe it. Well, it's, it's sickening. I mean, these are the same people who cry Allah Akbar, you know, as they're beheading people in anticipation of their 72 virgins, while simultaneously they're having sex with 14-year-old girls. I mean, they decry people who oppose Sharia law as infidels based on some pious religious morality. And they're paedophiles, they're raping children. Obviously, it's a minority, but, you know, it's a growing cancer, isn't it? Well, absolutely. And you hear about reports of 60-year-old men um, going to the... This was on Channel 4 News. 60-year-old uh, uh, Saudi Arabian men trying to find 13-year-old Syrian girls. Now, it's always been um, sort of a trend of these Gulf Arabs coming to Syria to uh, look for wives, usually they're from more poverty-stricken areas. But what's happening now is that they're engaging in these also temporary marriages, and some of the girls are being kidnapped and basically put into brothels. And uh, if you know they sign a piece of paper that says, oh, I'm going to marry you for an hour, they think that that religiously sanctifies uh, prostitution. And uh, if, uh, you know, in some cases it's just blatant rape, um, girls younger than 13 as well. And they, these are what the media calls freedom fighters. <laughs> they don't even stick to their own crazed fundamentalist ideology. They don't even live up to that. A, a minority of them, hopefully it's a minority, are, you know, murdering paedophile rapist scum, basically. So why don't the moderate FSA denounce Jabba al nusra denounce these extremists, why don't they say they're not associated with them? They do the opposite. They pledged allegiance to them, didn't they? They did. And part of the reason is that they're afraid of them. They're afraid of getting into infighting. Um, and also, you know, the Jabhat al-Nusra has been made more powerful than them. And I think that uh, is partly because of Qatar and Saudi Arabia making the funds flow, uh, in particular to those very extreme groups. But I also think that the U.S. would not let it happen unless they wanted it to happen. And I know in the media they're going on about the threat of um, uh, the Islamists in Syria and the jihadists and al-Qaeda ideologies. But uh, from just lessons of history, you can tell that the uh, U.S. government's interests are to fund these extremist groups, not these moderate groups, these moderate groups being just Muslim Brotherhood. Not that moderate at all, but uh, more moderate at least than the uh, Al-Qaeda ideology. Well, it's the fact that they airlifted in the Libyan Islamic fighting group terrorists after they'd done their dirty work in Libya. And they killed US troops in Iraq, admitted the NATO powers are airlifting them into Syria. So it's complete BS that they're just supporting the moderate rebels. They airlifted in some of the very terrorists that killed US troops in Iraq as we documented, as the Libya conflict was ongoing, into Syria uh, to begin that chaos. So now the New York Times, I met CIA shipping in guns while 
The Obama administration claims it's not giving lethal arms. It's, it's all complete propaganda. Let's move on, though, to Eric Haroon, who was this American citizen, former U.S. Army veteran, who fought alongside Jabba al-Nusra, the al-Qaeda terrorists, in Syria. He was then arrested upon his return to the United States by the FBI, after which his dad said he was working with the CIA. Surprise, surprise. And we wrote an article a few weeks ago now, near the beginning of March, I think it was, asking why Obama hadn't drone striked Haroon, just as they did with Anwar al-Awlaki and, of course, his 16-year-old son. And lo and behold, one week, I think it was one or two weeks later, Eric Haroon was arrested. So isn't it amazing that these, these Americans, these Brits, are called freedom fighters when they're in Syria, but as soon as they come back home, they're arrested as terrorists? Yeah, it's a real hypocrisy. You know, in the US, the UK, the Australian governments, they're all allowing terrorists to go and fight in Syria, but then are making laws that say once they come home, they'll be arrested. So they're afraid of them to be in their own um, countries, but they don't mind sending them over to Syria to bomb uh, the cities. So um, it's interesting that Eric's father claimed his son was CIA. But, you know, before we call on Obama to drone strike Eric Haroon, we should probably call on him to drone strike himself, since he's been the biggest funder and purveyor of terror around the world recently. Moving on to the, the online propaganda war that's ongoing between the pro-FSA and anti-FSA camps, I noticed about a week ago that YouTube was openly hosting Al-Qaeda's YouTube channel otherwise known as Jabba al-Nusra, al-Qaeda in Iraq, killed U.S. troops, the same terrorists who chop people's heads off on a regular basis. Meanwhile, they're censoring videos of war crimes committed by the FSA and other so-called so violent material while hosting al-Qaeda's YouTube channel. <laughs> Tell us about this amazing, again, hypocrisy that's going on with censorship and YouTube at the moment. Well, you know, it's... It's an attack on all fronts of any media that is against the mainstream media's line on Syria. My YouTube channel has almost been pulled uh, once, and now it's all again hanging on a thread. Uh, one more uh, flag, and it's out. Um, Press TV has been completely censored and is not no longer allowed in on US TV. And this is pretty significant in a country where um, you have you're supposed to have freedom of speech. Surely you're supposed to be able to listen to whatever media you want. Press TV is not allowed in America. And also the Syrian news channels are being bombed and targeted by the FSA. And they admit that uh, the Syrian state channels and pro-Syrian state channels are being targeted. Uh, all the while, uh, Al -Qaeda, and, and I'm not saying, it, you know, I'm not promoting censorship of any kind. I oppose censorship of any kind. But... In the meantime, hypocritically, Al Jazeera and other Al Qaeda spreading media, like the YouTube channel you mentioned, are just allowed to remain. So um, this is this is the fight we're facing. You know, uh, even with the mainstream media, with with all their money and all their influence, they still see us as a threat. So at least that's a compliment. Well, it, it seems as if. If you report on the atrocities allegedly committed by Assad and his forces, then you can have all the free speech you want. If for a second you try to focus on what the FSA have done, the atrocities they've carried out, then you're shut down almost immediately. And as you've said, they've targeted people across the board for that. But people, I mean, people who read the Al-Qaeda magazine Inspire go to prison in most countries. And then there was a, a Somali Al-Qaeda group that had an account on Twitter. They were banned very quickly, but apparently YouTube, while censoring everybody else, uh, seems to think it's okay to host Al-Qaeda's YouTube channel. So uh, they also censored one of your videos regarding a mercenary group, didn't they? Yeah, um, I had posted a video of a mercenary corporation called Aegis Sub. It's British-based. Uh, they were driving through the streets of Baghdad and randomly shooting at cars and actually resulted in a car accident and some deaths. And this company claimed copyright on this video. I'm not sure how you can copyright yourself killing people, but that's what you, did. That's what you do. 
and YouTube upheld it and the only way to counteract it is to give them your full name and address and I'm not prepared to do that but uh, that's one of the injustices that another one um, is community guidelines um, even though the YouTube policy states that you can have violence if it's for documentation of war crimes they're very selective about which violence they um, censor so of course if the violence is being perpetrated by a side that they want to show as bad, they might keep the video, otherwise they'll remove it. Um, the yellow man was censored until I complained about it, and now another video um, censored, which is uh, from six years back. Um, basically, there's a campaign uh, of people trying to flag my channel, uh, trying to bring my videos down, and for the most part, I see YouTube is going along with it and accepting um, some of the ludicrous uh, reasons to take down my videos and take down my channel. Well, it's part of the hypocrisy that's run through this entire conflict, as I said. Voices that speak out against the FSA are seemingly strangled, whereas those who, you know, talk all day about Assad's atrocities are allowed free reign. But to finish, let's clarify this conflict from a broader perspective. Why are the NATO powers and the U.S. attempting regime change in Syria, backing these terrorists to do it? What's the ultimate goal as you see it in the region? Well, basically, uh, the whole idea is uh, hegemony, uh, to bring the whole world under their control. Uh, from the IMF and the World Bank, neither of which Syria has any debt to, um, that's one thing they're trying to uh, introduce to Syria. That's uh, what's happened to Libya now. Um, also, Syria has outlawed, outlawed genetically modified food, which uh, is, is bound to get people angry uh, who are in high places. And as I said in one of my videos, genetically modified food is a way to control nations because those nations have to rely on your company to buy the seeds because that's the contractual obligation. And it, it leads to mass starvation, as in India. Uh, that's what's happening with the farmers. And of course, um, one of the biggest reasons for this war on Syria is um, the security of Israel. Uh, Israel occupies Palestine, and, but also Syrian land. And Syria, along with Iran, are the two countries left in the Middle East that oppose Israel and actually stand a chance to resist its aggression. And that's why the U.S.'s agenda is to break apart the alliance between Syria and Iran. And as you know, Iran is a Shiite state, and Syria being uh, a secular state, by turning uh, Syria into this Salafi uh, state, or even um, an Islamist that backs Saudi Arabia or Qatar, then it's definitely going to break ties with Iran. And that's what even the protesters themselves were chanting in 2011 that uh, we don't want Iran. So uh, this was all actually explained in an article by Seymour Hirsch in 2007, and it's called The Redirection. And I recommend everybody go ahead and read that article. It's a bit long, but it basically explains exactly what's, what's happened um, since uh, September 11th, since the Iraq war, um, and leading up to this point. And, you know, also, I believe in... 2006, uh, General Wesley Clark said that Syria was on a list of seven countries to be attacked within a decade. Um, the others were Libya, Iraq, Afghanistan, um, Sudan, Somalia. So really, all of those countries we have seen be attacked. And um, it's, just, it's, it's part of the reshaping of the Middle East. I know uh, one other part of it, uh, one other... Uh, uh, idea of the new Middle East is to try to do, cut up the countries in a different way. So basically, uh, uh, cutting up my country, my homeland, is on the uh, agenda. And Syria seems to be a lot stronger than those previous examples in standing up against that new world order hegemonic agenda. So we hope to see that continue. We'll leave it there for now, but just tell people how they can find your YouTube channel and your other social media outlets. Thanks a lot. Uh, my YouTube channel is Syrian Girl Partisan uh, with an S. I also have a new YouTube channel 
called Syrian Girl News and no spaces or anything in between. I have a Facebook, uh, Partisan Girl, and a Twitter, Partisan Girl. So I would be very grateful for your follow. Okay, Syrian Girl, thanks for joining us on InfoWars Nightly News. Thanks a lot. Thank you. That's it for this edition of InfoWars Nightly News. Be sure to subscribe to PrisonPlanet.tv and we'll see you on the next edition. Bye for now.